This morning we turn to one of the more difficult passages in the New Testament, so turn with me, if you will, as we study through 1 Corinthians, we are in chapter 11. And the subject and the question this morning has to do with Paul's discussion regarding women with head coverings. The rise of secular and theological liberalism, I think, in the world today has relegated this passage to the ash heap of perhaps irrelevance, chauvinism, or error. The rise of feminism, I think we could say, may have relegated this passage to neglect at best, scorn at worst. And so now I'm the person who's going to take up the challenge and discuss 1 Corinthians 11, perhaps be a, a pariah, if that's the word, an obscuritist in the eyes of men. But that's what we're going to look at today because as far as I can tell, the passage is still in the Bible. And since the passage is still in the Bible, though the modern world would like to remove it from there, I think it merits our uh, inquiry and study. So turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 2, and verse through verses 16, where the apostle talks about what's right and what's wrong. And he asks the question, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Let me read the passage beginning in verse 2. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as, as, just as I delivered them to you. So Paul begins, I think, a new section. Remember back in chapter 8 he said, now concerning things sacrificed to idols. That was a new section. And usually when he begins a new section he says, now concerning. But here he doesn't say that, but he does talk about events that have to do with the uh, practice or observation, I think, of the church meeting, because he'll talk later about the abuse of the Lord's Supper. And so I think this is a new section. He's moved beyond things sacrificed to idols. And so on the one hand, he commends them, and he says to them that he is thankful that they remember him in the traditions, in the things evidently that Paul had taught them or passed on to them. So he begins with that praise, but then in verse 3, though, he wants to clarify something. He wants to reveal a truth of God that is relevant to their meeting. And so in verse 3, he says, But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Now, what Paul is doing here, I think, is revealing Christian truth. This is something that is revealed. That is, it takes a revelation from God. And Paul, as a prophet, knows this. Other passages in the Bible teach it as well. But I think he's revealing an order in the uh, creation of God or the universe of God. Not just the creation, because it goes before and beyond that. But he's saying that God has an order. We might say an order of authority. And in that order of authority, God or God the Father is in the first position. And God the Father is the head of Christ. Now Christ is God the Son. And Christ is fully God, and yet he takes a position, though, of submission to the will of the Father. And then it says that Christ is the head of a man, and then it says the man is the head of a woman. Now the word head is a key word here to help understand the passage. I think the word head in the Bible refers to being in a position of authority. In Ephesians chapter 5 it says the husband is the head of the wife. So I think here just as Christ is of the church, so I think here we see here that he's saying there's this order in God's world. That God the Father is in the first position of head, God the Son is in the second position, and then beneath them there's Christ who's the head of man, and then the man is the head of a woman. Now I think that's the order that he's referring to. Now when we say that though, I think we want to be very careful that we try to explain what does that mean. What does that mean? For example, in the case of Christ, are we saying that God the Father is better or more God or superior to God the Son. Now if we said that, that would be wrong. That would be heresy because God the Son is fully God. He's the eternal God. So God the Father is not superior to God the Son. They're both two persons within the Trinity who are fully God, but they have a different role or position. Now Jesus in one place in John chapter 10 said, I and the Father are one. So he is the same essence with the Father. 
But in another place, Jesus said, the Father is greater than I. Now, how could the Father be greater than the Son if the Son is fully God? Because if the Father is greater than the Son and the Son is fully God, wouldn't that mean one's better? But no, it doesn't mean one's better because when he says the Father is greater than I, where's that? I think John chapter 14, verse 28, he's talking about position. He's saying the Father occupies the first position in the Godhead, the Son occupies the second position. So when we look at this structure of authority, even within the Godhead, we'd say that there's three distinct persons, one in essence, and yet one is in a higher position of authority, but all three are equal in person. Now when we say that, then let's bring that down to the discussion of mankind. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, when he says that, what he's saying here is that the image of God is most fully seen in mankind. And mankind consists of male and female. So mankind then has two parts to it, and each part is fully human, but they're distinct and different. Now, that sounds somewhat similar to what we just said about the Godhead, didn't we? Where we said, except there, there are three parts, but you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons, each person fully God, equal in person, one in essence, and yet different in position and role. In a similar way with humankind, what we have is we have two persons who are equal in personhood, equal in worth, but distinct in role. And so I think what he's saying here is he is revealing that God has an order within the Godhead and he has an order within humankind. And so that's, I think, the basis or the foundation of trying to understand what I consider to be a difficult passage. So what we're saying here is just as God is three distinct persons, one in essence, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. He also is indicating that the Father is, a, is in a position of authority above him. In a similar way, I think he's referring to a male and a female. I think he's referring probably in the marriage relationship where they're equal in personhood but distinct in role. And so I think that's the foundation for the passage. Now then go to verse 4. He stated his principle or the order of creation or even beyond creation. And then he says in verse 4, Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. Now, what are we to make of this? Well, there are several things that we could make of this. Uh, some people would make nothing of it. And they say, this is irrelevant. This is archaic. This is ridiculous. It has no relevance at all. And that's one view, and that's probably the popular view of our culture. Now, it's interesting that if you go about the world, there are certain countries in the world, in Eastern Europe, for example, where, or even in the Middle East, where it's not at all uncommon for women in a church setting to have their head covered. And to have their head covered there is probably, and what Paul probably meant here, probably was not just a hat, but probably some type of a shawl that was pulled up a little more over the head. And so, what are we to make of this passage? Well, there's people in the world today who make of the passage to say that the passage applies in that a woman should have her head covered. Now, if that's your view and you hold that view, I respect that view. And if I was preaching in a church in Eastern Europe and women took that view, I'd have no problem at all uh, encouraging my wife to uh, be submissive to that particular view they have there. Now, having said that, though, I think those are the two extremes of that particular question. What shall we make of the passage? Make nothing of the passage, or the passage applies uh, in that manner. Now, I think we should ask ourselves when we look at passages like this, okay, now this is what he said in that culture, but is there a timeless principle that transcends that culture that has a lesson for us? 
And I think there is. I think there is a timeless principle that transcends the historical setting in Corinth at this time that applies to us. And so that's what I'm striving for, to find what is that principle. Now, with that being my goal, I'm going to say the whole question of authority, I think, is the foundation of studying the passage and understanding the passage. Now, when he says if a woman has her head uncovered, she is one and the same as one whose head is shaved. Now, we have to say, well, what does that mean? And I would say here that if I look out this morning and I see women this morning without their heads uncovered, I don't think of them as being uh, somehow or other sh uh, a woman whose head is shaved. And of course, that was probably a sign of some sort of disgrace. In the book of Numbers, if a woman was found guilty of immorality, she would have her head shaved. So that was a bad thing. Well, what, what is the cultural connection well, Roy Zook writes something here I think that is helpful to me. He says, in the first century Judaism and in the Greco-Roman world, wearing a head covering in public was in fact a sign of a woman's submission to her husband. Not to wear it was an indication of insubordination or rebellion. This is mentioned in 3rd Maccabees verse 36 or chapter 36 and in the writings of Plutarch, a Roman statesman. Then he goes down later and says, in Corinth, sacred prostitutes, that is those associated with pagan temples, did not wear shawls. It is also noteworthy that Jewish women did not wear a head covering until they were married. There was no need to do so since they were not under the authority of their husband. Now, if that's correct, what I think he's saying here is we should ask ourselves, well, what was the significance of the head covering in the culture? And if he's correct, and I think that's probably correct, he says the significance was that it was a sign of being in submission to her husband. Now, as we've studied the Corinthians, we've seen already that the Corinthians were enamored with their newfound liberties, rights, and freedoms. And they really weren't too much inclined to be concerned about other people's being built up, but they were saying, we're free, we have our rights, and we're going to do what we want to do. And so Paul would continually say, well, now all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. So he's trying to get them to see what is profitable and what is profitable and what edifies. And again, we're trying to put ourselves in the, in the passage and say, what's going on here? Is it possible that there are some women who felt like we're free in Christ? And since we're free in Christ, this headdress, which may represent being in submission to our husband, well, in Christ... Male and female are equal. And as he says in Galatians in another place, Galatians chapter 3, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. They may have thought, we don't need to wear this sign of submission. Is that a possibility? I think that's a possibility of what's going on here. So it is true that we're free in Christ. It is true that male and female are one in Christ. It is true that male and female are created in the image of God and are equal heirs of God's creation. But it's still there's a distinction in order, and I think the apostle is saying that that distinction should be maintained and preserved. And if there's a cultural symbol that is disrespectful or the lack of the symbol is disrespectful, then that's a bad thing. And I think he's correcting that particular abuse or problem there. So he says in verse 4 then, after he's told them about the order that God has ordained where the husband is the head of the woman, he says, every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. So if that's some sign of submission, he shouldn't have any sign of submission on his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. Now the commentators say, does that refer to her literal head? Does that refer to her head, the husband? Does it refer to both? I think it could refer to both. I think probably it refers to the literal head, her head, because that's what he's talking about there. But I think implied in that, it's, it's disgraceful or it is disrespectful to her husband. It disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. In other words, the idea of if it's disgraceful for a woman to have her head shaved, 
Then he's saying, so is it for her to be uncovered. For a woman does not ha- for if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it's disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. So that's the practice that he commands there that I think reflects the order of creation that God has done now or made. Now in verse 7 he's going to give us some reasons. For a man ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and the glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. Now again we saw that in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 that man made in, as male and female are the image of God. But it doesn't talk about the glory of God there. And so he adds something different here where he says man is the image and the glory of God. So there's in a sense there, there's something in the creation of the man. And I think it probably refers to him with his headship or his authority that he is not only image of God, the glory of God. But then there's something he introduces here that we don't find in a previous passage where he talks about the woman. And he says the woman is the glory of the man. Now he'll say in a minute that the woman was taken from the man so that there's something unique about the woman that glorifies the man. Well, I think that's certainly true and I think we can see that, that a wife is the glory of her husband. I think we could see that and we could say that and we could say that if a woman is doing something that is culturally disrespectful, that that takes away from the glory which she sheds upon her husband. So again, I'm acknowledging to you that I believe this is a difficult passage and I'm trying to give you my understanding of the passage, but I think what he's saying is there's some unique glory of the man related to God and a unique glory of the woman related to the man, and so the woman ought to reflect that particular position in her wearing the head covering that shows her respect to her husband. Now, let's go to the next one. It says in verse 8, For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. So not only is there a different glory, there is a different origin. Now, God created the man directly from the dust of the ground. God created the woman from the rib of the man. So they have a different origin. If you look in 1 Timothy, Paul makes the argument there in verse 2.13. He says, Adam was created first and then Eve. So again, there's a There's a point that the apostle makes from the order of creation that he uses to say that the man is in this position of authority. And so that's why this, I believe, cultural symbol or sign should be observed. Then we look in verse 9. For indeed man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. And so there I think what he's saying is that there is a different Role. In other words, the woman was created because God looked at all that he had created and said it was good, and yet he looked at the man by himself and he said it is not good that the man should be alone. In other words, this is the first time in the whole creation account that there was something that God said was not good. And what was not good was that the man was alone, and so we would say that God then created the woman. He said, I will make a help meet or helper corresponding to him, that he needed her to complete him. And again, the word help meet, help mate, he Uh, helper, sometimes that's thought of as a a condescending term, but it really isn't. Because in Hebrew, that term for helper is also used of God himself, where he's called the helper of Israel. So it's not a condescending term. And when it says corresponding to, that means or a help meet suitable. The idea here is that it's his equal, it's his counterpart. In other words, that the woman is that which is made of the man and completes him. Some have said if God made the the woman out of the dust of the ground like he made the man out of the dust of the ground, that some would say, well, the woman's inferior to the man. But he didn't do that. He didn't make the woman out of the dust of the ground. He made the woman out of the rib of the man. And why did he do that? I think in part to show that the woman is of the same stuff, if you would, as the man. In other words, we see that in our language. We say man and we say Woman. Now, what does woman mean? Where does that come from? It comes from the word womb, man. 
What is a woman? A woman is a man with a womb. It's also the same in Hebrew. The idea that for male it's ish and the woman is isha. I mean, even in the words male and female, you see you have the same basic root in each one of those words. So when we talk about the distinction of gender, we're saying that sure the genders are distinct, but they're of the same sort. In other words, what is a woman? She is a female man. And we'd say, what is a man? He's a male man. Well, not exactly. <laughs> Not exactly, but I think you get my point there. He is a male man. When it says he created man in his own image, he's talking about here mankind consisting of the male and the female. So that's what he says there. Then he says in verse 10, Therefore the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Well, now literally in your text there it says, Therefore the woman ought to have authority on her head because of the angels. Now that's a difficult verse too. First of all, it doesn't say symbol of authority, it says authority. But I think the New American Standard here is probably correct. I think what the New American Standard is saying is that when the woman appears in the appropriate manner, that that gives her the authority here to speak or at least to pray and prophesy because that's what he says. And I think it's in the public meeting because that seems to be the context and so that when she does that, she has that authority. And then he says, throws you another issue, because of the angels. Now, like I said, this is an interpreter's uh, uh, gymnasium here. I mean, you've gotten lots of different questions. And what does he mean because of the angels? And I think what he means there is we see in 1 Peter, it talks about the preaching of the gospel, things in which angels long to see. They look, and so I think angel obs uh, observe the decorum of the church. The angels, I think, are respectful. The angels have ranks. The angels have order. And so I think what he's saying here is that there should be an order or a decorum in the practice of the church. And if there's disrespect going on, then that is offensive to the angels. So that's another reason. Then he gets to verse 11, though, which I would say is a clarification to make sure that chauvinistic men don't read this the wrong way. He says, however, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is the man independent of woman. So he says, guys, don't get too carried away by this because even though you are created first and she was created out, of, created out of you, ever since then it's been the other way around. Every man has found his origin in the woman. And the point there is that the genders are mutually dependent on one another. That's what he says in verse 12. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman and all things originate from God. Then in verse 13 he says, Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Now I think the nature of the question is basically saying, Judge for yourselves. Is this appropriate? Now, to be honest, it doesn't bother me. But I think I'm in a different culture. And I think the nature or the sense of his question seems to be an obvious answer, that it would be offensive, it would be inappropriate. And so he says here, you judge for yourselves, is it proper, is it appropriate, doesn't it offend your sense of, of what is respectable and appropriate? That's the point, I think, of his question. And then he says in verse 14, which I think here is some natural law, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him, but if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her as a covering. Now that's a different word for covering than the word used before, but I think what he's saying here is that, and I think generally in most cultures, the length of hair for women is longer than the length of hair for men. And I think most people would say even from, a, from a, an anatomy standpoint, because of estrogen, women's hair grows longer than men. And he says here that that particular natural design is reflective of the cultural practice of the woman having a covering. And so I think what he's saying here is, is, is it appropriate for the woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? The answer is no, it's not. Now you say, well, as we started out this morning, though, we said, what, what, what difference does it make? How do we apply it? And I said, some people 
don't apply it at all. Other people apply it and say, yes, the, the, the passage should be applied literally as it's read. But is there some timeless principle that we can see in the passage that we can apply to ourselves? And I think there is, and I would make the one statement, and if you hold this view over here, that you should have the head covering, I respect that view, and you are free and welcome to do so, and to do so in this church, and you would be received warmly. We've had people that have done that, and that's fine. If that's what you want to do, and if that's how you understand the passage, then we commend you, and that's fine. But is there a timeless principle? And I think the timeless principle has to do with that which is appropriate, which reflects the order that God has revealed in the passage. And I think if there are things that a woman does that contradict that particular order, those are troublesome. Now let me give you an example of some that might be a problem. What if a woman said in our culture, I am married, but I don't want to wear my wedding ring. Well, is that a problem? And you say, well, no woman would do that. Well, I am aware of women who you know, that's a position. I think that's not an uh, unheard of position. I, I think that would be a problem, wouldn't it? If a woman said, I'm married, but you know what? I don't want to wear my wedding ring, so I'm not going to. Now, I could get in trouble with this one here, but what if a woman said, you know, I'm married, but I don't want to take my husband's last name. Uh, now, what if about a hyphenated name? Well, I think that's a little different there. But if a woman said, you know, I'm married, but I, this idea of taking his last name, I like my last name. So I'm going to stick with my last name. I don't think the passage exactly corresponds to that, but that might be an issue. What about one time I went to see a particular well-known, nationally known speaker, and I went to see him speak in another city, and I got there, and I felt like when I saw his wife, I felt her clothing was actually immodest. Now, her clothing was immodest. I'm not making it up. At least I thought it was. I don't think I'm the, the weirdest person in the world. I thought it was immodest. Now, how does that reflect upon her being respectful and submissive to her husband? Now, within the passage, remember the passage does talk about even the hair is given as a covering and that the head covering clearly was a covering and I think the woman is the glory of the man and I think he's saying and I think the Bible teaches as it does in other places that there's a very big emphasis on the need for women to dress modestly. I think that's a timeless principle. Now that can vary from culture to culture a little bit what's modest and what isn't but I can tell you in every culture there are certain things that are immodest. And those are easily picked up on the people around. So that's not a, a, a negotiable. In other words, I think what he's saying here, that there are timeless principles where a woman acts and behaves in such a way that reflects her submission to her husband, her contentment in her married status. And she's not trying to attract attention of other men or she's not trying to be uh, 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 disrespectful. So I think those are some examples that we might say are timeless principles. I think modesty. I, how about a, the way a woman speaks about her husband? I think that also is very important. Now the Bible says a lot of things that husbands should do to, uh, toward their wives. So wives, I hope you don't think I'm just picking on you today. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm the guy that's got the hard job. I've got to explain the passage. You ought to give me a little grace. But, but still, I had one... One fellow, a friend of mine who was going to be gone today, and he wanted to know a couple weeks ago, what are you going to say about 1 Corinthians 11? What are you going to say? Because that's one of the difficult of several difficult passages in the book of 1 Corinthians. And I think there's a timeless principle that goes beyond the head covering, which is a principle that the woman, the wife, should reflect in her behavior, in her speech, in her appearance, that she is submissive to her husband. And if she doesn't do that, she's, I think, violating the principles of the passage. And I think in particular, I'd focus on the aspect of immodesty, because I think that's something directly seen in the passage. So I think that's what the apostle is giving us as a timeless principle that we certainly can apply.
And then he says in verse 16, he says, but if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice. That word there could also be translated custom, nor have the churches of God. He says, this is the way we do it. And if you want to argue about it, you know what? Too bad, because this is the way we do it. In other words, I think he is saying here that this was their practice, this was their custom, but what we've tried to see, what is the theological principle behind it and how can we apply that to ourselves? And I would say that this is certainly consistent and in harmony with what the relationship with God the Father in God the Son. Was God the Son ever disrespectful to God the Father? Wasn't God the Son always in harmony with the Father? Didn't God the Son always submit to the will of the Father? Didn't God the Son always follow what the Father wanted him to do? What's the greatest example of that? In John 14, 30, Jesus said, I will speak, I will not speak much more with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me but that the world may know that I love the Father and as the Father gave me commandment even so I do. What's he talking about? The Father gave me commandment. Well the commandment was that the Son would go to the cross. So we see the greatest act of submission is the Son submitting to the will of the Father when he went to the cross. Jesus himself prayed in Gethsemane. He says, Father, if possible, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Passage we looked at last week, talk about Christ. It says, have this attitude in yourselves, which also was in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's your greatest act of submission. That's the greatest act of being under the authority of another, even death on a cross. And when the son was so submissive to the will of the father, what happened to him? It says, therefore God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you see, when we are submissive to the will and the order of God, What does it say? Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. And I think here this is a passage where he's just talking about decorum and order and propriety. And he says that in the kingdom of God, the people of God consisting of male and female should reflect a decorum and a propriety that honors and exalts God and honors and exalts each other. Just as the husband is to love his wife, just as Christ also is to love the church, the wife is to respect her husband. And I think here, show that respect in her appearance, in the way she carries herself, even in the things that she may say and do. I think that's the passage as I see it. Well, and if you've never trusted in Christ, though, I want you to see that his submission makes possible your forgiveness. But you need to trust in him. You need to make a decision where you say, I've sinned, I've broken God's law, I cannot pay for my own sins. But I'm trusting that on the cross, Jesus died for me. I trust him as my savior. Well, and if you've never trusted in Christ though, I want you to see that his submission makes possible your forgiveness. But you need to trust in him. You need to make a decision where you say, I've sinned, I've broken God's law, I cannot pay for my own sins. But I'm trusting that on the cross, Jesus died for me. I trust him as my savior. 